नमो नमस्ते गुरवे महात्मने विमुक्त संगाय सदुत्तमाय निद्वयानंदरसस्वूपिणे भूमि सदा पारदया बुधा नमस्ते नमस्ते विभो विश्वमूर्ते नमस्ते नमस्ते चिदानंदमूर्ते नमस्ते नमस्ते तपोयोगगम्य नमस्ते नमस्ते श्रुति ज्ञानगम्य नमस्ते नमस्ते तपोयोगगम्य नमस्ते नमस्ते श्रुति ज्ञानगम्य स्वराज्य साम्राज्य विभूतिरेशा भवत्कृपा श्रीमहिम प्रसाद प्राप्ता मया श्रीगुरव महात्मने नमो नमस्ते स्तु पुनर्नमोस्तु नमो नमस्ते स्तु पुनर्नमोस्तु नमो नमस्ते स्तु पुनर्नमोस्तु नमस्तस्म सदक कस्म चिन्मसे नम यदेतूपेण राजते गुरुराजते यदेतूपेण राजते गुरुराजते so this is going to be the last lecture as such after that swami ji has the concluding lecture only so all these 10 days i think all of you have been floating in devotion and knowledge also that is what happens from morning till evening you are getting so much of satsanga so much of association with sat purushas as well as the scriptures which perhaps we do not get otherwise and we have been floating in this exposure shrimad bhagavatam says in the beginning itself in the first skanda second chapter that we go to the punna teerthas the places of pilgrimages where we happen to meet some mahapurushas some knowers some saints and by the association with the saints we develop fondness for the words of truth words about the lord and as we develop the fondness for the lord those hari katha or the the lord's word lord's description his exploits everything as it is constantly repeated in the mind we constantly interact with them that is actually keeping the lord within our mind within us keeping the lord alive within our mind so remaining in our mind the lord washes off all the abhadrani 
what is abhadrani this bhadram is a great word anything auspicious is called bhadram to speak the truth the real bhadram is the soul the atma or the brahman which is same as the atma the ultimate truth where there is no division at all no bheda buddhi no division at all the last division we have is the division between subject and object that is i am seeing the world or i am as a knower knowing the truth there are three divisions there the knower the knowledge and the knowing process when all these divisions are also gone that is the real bhadram but whatever we hear whatever we receive if it helps us to go near to that abheda darshanam near to that unfragmented vision all our vision is generally fragmented it takes us towards the unfragmented vision that is called the bhadram this word comes repeatedly in the upanishads in the shanti mantras also in the vedas that ano bhadra kratavo yantu vishvatah we pray that let all the auspicious inputs come from all sides they enter us ano bhadra kratavo yantu vishvatah let from all sides of the universe from all directions the auspicious things enter our mind enter our within truly speaking we pray that but really the auspicious things they don't have to come from outside they have to be generated within as long as we are not able to generate the auspicious thoughts the auspicious vision within coming from outside they will not be able to give us the touch of auspiciousness so finally this bhadram we have to remember always and whenever our behavior our thoughts get polluted with divisional feeling that this person i like this person i don't like i don't want to see him that day i he did something i am not able to forget throughout the day we are keeping all the inauspicious thoughts within all that is corrupted polluted with the bheda buddhi until all those are taken away the bhadram does not appear in us bhagavatam says shushusho shraddha dhanasya vasudeva katha ruchi syan mahat sevaya vipraah punya teerth nishevanat shinvat shinvatam svakatha krishna punya shravana kirtanah ऋद्यतस्थो ह्यवद्राणी विधुनोति सुहृद सताम हु इज द फ्रेंड ऑफ ऑल ऑफ अस रिमेनिंग विद इन अस विधुनो विधुनोति ही वॉशेस ऑफ ऑल द अभद्राज फ्रॉम विद इन दैट इज हाउ द वर्ड्स ऑफ द लॉर्ड एज यू हियर एज वी हियर एंड वी गो ऑन चर्निंग द मेन साइड they remove all the inauspiciousness all the bheda buddhi all the differential notions likes and dislikes from within our mind bhagavatam gives a sequence of how one gets to the ultimate level the next verse says nashta prayeshu abhadreshu nityam bhagavata sevaya bhagavatyut उत्तम श्लोके भक्तिर्भवति न इष्टिकी हि सेज दैट व्हेन दिस अभद्र ऑल द इनॉस्पिशियस थॉट्स दे गो बाय रिपीटेड रिमिनेशन ऑन द भक्ति देन वी जनरेट वी डेवलप नैष्ठिकी भक्ति टुवर्ड्स द लॉर्ड दिस नैष्ठिकी भक्ति that means one pointed devotion towards the lord we generate it should come tada rajas tamo bhavah kamalo bhadayashtaye cheta etairana vidham sthitam satve prasidati he says that then that all the 
kama, lobha, all those polluting thoughts, those arise from the rajoguna and tamoguna, they are not able to touch us anymore. They are not able to influence or affect us anymore. And the mind remains steady on the sattva guna, which immediately comes with the prasannata. The sattva guna has the prasada guna with it. So we remain in prasada with the arousal of the sattva guna. Evam prasanna manaso bhagavad bhakti yogataha bhagavad tattva vijnanam mukta sangasya jayate he says, when we remain with this prasanna chitta, when the mind remains placid with the touch of Bhagavad Bhakti, the devotion towards the Lord, then we start getting the knowledge of the truth. We start getting liberated from all the bondage which the gunas generate. We start reveling in the freedom. Then what happens? The last step, he says, Vidyate hridaya granthihi chidyante sarva samshayaha kshiyante chasya karmani drishta evatmani shware. He says, when we see the Lord within our own Atma, drishta, Eva Atmani Ishvare. When we see the Lord in our Atma itself, then what happens? Three things happen. Vidyate Hridaya Granthihi Chidyante Sarvasamshayaha Kshiyante Chasya Karmani These are the three results, the ultimate results of spirituality. Hridaya Granthihi Well, it means the knot in our heart. We can call it ego, but it is coming from desires. We can call it desires, we can call it ego. The, all the knots of our heart are broken. The knots which always make us constricted, which always makes our mind, which always make our mind looking for what we like, we cling to that, we start hating what we dislike. All those things are coming from desires. And which is mine and which is others, we always have a preferred preference towards what we are and always have a differential opinion towards others. All those things, those knots of the heart, they get broken. That is the first result. The res the, this knot of the heart getting broken means we attain an infinitude. Normally we think we are constricted, we are small, we are limited by the body-mind personality. We are always missing, we are suffering from insufficiency, we are suffering from lack of contentment, always that goes on. So breaking the knots of the heart means we attain an infinitude where we don't no longer suffer from any insufficiency at all. We feel always sufficient, we feel fulfilled, we feel contented. Chidyante sarva samshayaha. The first one is an emotional knot. Vidyate hridaya granthi. The second one is an intelligential knot. That is the, all the doubts created by our intelligence. All the doubts created by our intelligence, they go, they leave us. We become doubtless. We become free of our all enquiry. And the last is Kshiyante Chasya Karmani. He does not have any more work. Does he not work? Yes, he does. He does much more than the others. He does ten times the others. But even then, he doesn't have any karma at all. That means that he does not have the Katritva Bodha and Bhoktritva Bodha. That I am doing this, I am doing that. And by doing this, I will become happy. By getting this, I will become happy. This katri bhoktri bhava, he gets freed of. These are the three benefits he finally gets. Now, I have a question that Srimad Bhagavata is given in this one, two, three, four, five shlokas giving the whole sequence 
from coming to a pun- punya tirtha to a place of pilgrimage and getting in the association of the wise and the wise and the wisdom scriptures from there how we get liberated in these five shlokas it is completely described but i have a question that does it happen to us we have been this is the 12th shrimad bhagavata tatva samiksha satram and this naimisharanyam is more than a pilgrimage for 10 days here constantly morning to evening bhagavata tatva katha is going on we have been taking bath in this ganges from morning till evening but after 10 days what happens thereafter when we get back do we get all these sequential developments what they have said do the abhadra visions the abhadra thoughts leave our mind are we able to get rid of the blaming tendencies the egoistic tendencies the desire for small small things holding on clinging on to small small things which they have said which should come from the devotion from the hari katha shravana at the beginning do we have it we have to question ourselves that why why don't we have it 12 years have passed and many of us must be listening to all these years how far we have gone and throughout the year how we are living our life has our mind become auspicious it has has it become bhadra we have to question naturally when we enquire and when we look within we find that it has not happened then we have to question that why it has not happened what is the reason that it has not happened that means whatever we are taking from the punya tirtha this naimisharanyam we are not able to preserve it there is definitely something wrong with the retentivity with us the satya dhruti satya dhruti means the power to retain whatever truth we hear if that we are not able to do then what is the benefit of it if it is only benefit for 10 days we revel the talks and we come and we revel our association and then the world remains the same the life remains the same the days remain the same then what is the benefit should we not question so how to increase this retentivity how to make this benefits permanent that is the main problem in yoga vasishta vasishta deva points out that it is because of lack of vichara that we are not able to retain anything whatever we hear whatever we read unless the vichara goes on constantly we will not be able to retain because the world by its very nature it will overwhelm us it will come with all its delusiveness all its delusions and that will take us away again from the bhadram exposure what we have got in naimisharanyam yoga vasishta says vichara tikshnata metya dhih pasyati param padam dirgha samsara rogasya vicharo hi mahoushadham he says that of this ancient disease called samsara the our samsara means the worldliness world there is nothing wrong the world will remain as it is when a knower somebody becomes a knower the world doesn't change for him the world remains as it is the change all takes place in our mind the change takes place in the removal of the worldliness samsara means the worldliness this ancient disease called samsara dirgha samsara rogasya vicharo hi mahoushadham vichara is the great medicine for that what happens by vichara vichara tikshnata metya dhi pasyati param padam 
what happens by vichara is that constantly interacting with this truth what is permanent what is impermanent what is transient by holding on to what i will attain the eternal placidity or peace by holding on to what i will again be affected by the good and bad by the evil and the beneficial beneficial things that constant vichara done in your buddhi in our intelligence by that what happens is that the buddhi undergoes a transformation our intelligence undergoes a transformation it is this knowledge and the knowledge practice is not that we come to know that this is the truth this is what the atma is or this is this is what the brahman is the entire knowledge pursuit is to constantly make the mind and the intelligence interact with the truth whenever we are interacting with anything we receive the property of that suppose a ball is moving another ball is standing when this ball hits the other ball the steady ball starts moving the energy from the moving ball goes over to the standing ball there is an exchange taking place it is a gross exchange that we are seeing similarly there is always an exchange taking place much more important although it is subtle but it is much much more important than the gross exchanges which is taking place within us whatever the mind is given to interact with the mind accrues the mind absorbs the qualities from with from which it is interacting with suppose we are you can easily find out also when you stay with a peaceful person with a saint or the peaceful person you will find automatically peace dawns in our mind and when we are staying with somebody who is very agitated very disturbed you will find automatically there is an agitation dawning in our mind how does it happen this must be an experience of everybody how does it happen it automatically we get influenced by the ambience we are in similarly whenever we are in the world we are interacting with the likes and dislikes right from the childhood we are interacting with what i like what i dislike as a small child i would always prefer to play something maybe i like the doll now when the doll is taken away i start crying that means i like the doll i want it if i don't get it i cry there is always whatever i like if i get i am happy whatever i dislike if i get i am unhappy we are always unhappy in facing what we dislike or in losing what we like that goes on forever so this constantly interacting the mind is interacting with this divided world of likes and dislikes preference and prejudice ishta and ishta it is going on it is always getting affected by that it is influenced by this world by that what we are gaining is a fragmented mind this i like this i dislike so the whole world is fragmented and constantly interacting with that with the likes and dislikes our mind is getting fragmented it is always thinking in terms of small small fragmented things this i like this i don't like etc now if the same mind is given to interact with a soul or with the atma or the brahman which is all pervading infinite which never gets affected by anything at all which reveals the good reveals the bad also never getting affected by it which is like the sun when the sun reveals the garbage does it smell the sunlight does not smell the sunlight does not get affected when it reveals the rose does it become fragrant sunlight only reveals the rose as well as the garbage its duty is to only to reveal like that the atma is only revealing revealing everything the more and more through the shastras through the satsangs through our pilgrimages we interact with this transcendental truth which we ourselves are which is our real identity which is our atma as we go on interacting with it we slowly accrue the qualities of this atma 
as we interacting with the likes and dislikes we develop fragmentation of the mind by interacting with the uniform unaffected atma the mind starts becoming uniform unaffected all pervading so even if this soul or a brahman had not existed suppose it is a, it was a myth even then this knowledge pursuit would have given us this mindset that mind would have become like the atma as we are discussing or the brahman it would have already generated it would have accrued all the qualities of this of the atma or the brahman so the knowledge pursuit is not really to know what is the atma or what is the brahman but it is to constantly make the buddhi interact with the the concept of the atma concept of the soul the concept of the brahman and by that the buddhi undergoes a transformation it becomes subtle uniform unified it gets a comprehensive vision of the truth so it is a transform transformation of the buddhi that takes place so that is why he said vicharat tikshnata metya dhihi pashyati param padam this constant vichara the process of vichara the constantly understanding ruminating contemplating on the truth by that the buddhi finally sees or realizes the param padam the truth the ultimate truth the real atma which is infinite which is one and beyond one transcendental which is the same as the brahman now this is where they have shown that this vichara we have to continue now what is this roga they are calling that samsara dirgha rogasya what is this roga what is this samsara roga that when we look into it we find that from childhood we are slave to the external world whatever we like if we get we are happy the moment the situation changes we are immediately agitated suppose somebody praises me then we get elated if he abuses me immediately we get agitated or depressed and we start abusing him also that means immediately we lo- lose our self seatedness suppose somebody is abusing me wrongly also it is not true of me maybe out of some misunderstanding he is abusing us wrongly but that immediately upsets our mind we get agitated we get upset about it that means the peace of our mind that is the peace of our mind is getting disturbed by whatever is happening outside that is why we say that we are slave to the circumstances we are slave to the objects and the objective situations they have the world has full control over us now in that world we have to become unaffected we have to become master of the world how can we become that now we feel look into it we will understand that this affectation is not because of the world but it has to do with our mind by treating our mind we can immediately we can easily remain unaffected that getting something which i like i get elated and getting something which i dislike i get agitated it depends on my likes and dislikes if we prepare our mind if we make our mind ready to accept both then whatever the situation we will not get affected at all our swami ji always gave, gives an example that suppose somebody has lost his relatives somebody has lost his property lost his job lost his wealth everything and he is standing on the street absolutely depressed dejected thinking of committing suicide now another person who has taken up sanyasa he has willfully renounced his job renounced his property renounced his building renounced his relatives he is also standing alone alone on the street and he is happiest in that moment where lies the difference externally both are same the two persons external situation both are same there is no difference at all in the first case it has happened providentially 
but he is not ready to accept whatever has happened he is not ready to accept the situation in the other case he has deliberately deliberately opted for the situation so he is happy when that situation has come now if the first person he could not have avoided the situation it has providentially come he in any case is will have to withstand the situation but if he prepares his mind with the readiness that i will accept what is there i have lost everything and if i want i can again work for it again try to get back everything but readily accept the situation which has providentially come then immediately the stress the tension the pressure the agitation the affectation he is suffering from immediately it will go will it not it will immediately go so what do we have to do there we have only to make our mind ready to accept that's all the situation has happened providentially in any case we have to accept it but our mind does not accept so it has nothing to do with the world at all it is the non acceptance of the mind which is creating all the problem so this how do we have it this is what they are saying by surrender in the bhagavat bhagavata shastra what they are saying this is called surrender this is called samatva this is called knowledge also this is called desirelessness desirelessness means what i will not have desire for anything that means whatever comes i will accept surrender means what whatever gives it comes it is given by the lord so i i have to accept and i will accept also that is the surrender samatva also whatever comes we will accept that so everywhere this is the same the actually in in fact the reality is the same whether we approach to knowledge or through samatva buddhi or through surrender it is the same thing but we are not practicing it that is the main problem that is why the benefit we obtain from the punya teertha naimisha ranyam is not staying with us that is what in bhagavad gita when arjuna said that oh krishna you have discussed this samatva yoga so well because you are seated in that samatva yoga but my mind is absolutely restless i am not able to grasp the depth of it whatever you have taught i am not able to realize the depth of it then what did krishna say he says that yes it is very true the mind's very nature is restless so it will be restless but that is not the ultimate word it has to be made restful how by abhyasena tu kaunteya vairagyena cha grihyate he has clearly pointed out that what do we have to practice to retain anything we get from the discussion on truth from satsanga from the pilgrimages whatever we get how do we preserve it we have to preserve it through abhyasa and vairagya what is this abhyasa abhyasa means constantly trying to get back to our real anchor our real identity that the uniform universal soul somehow getting connected to our inmost self abhyasa could be meditation abhyasa could be reading the shastras abhyasa could be listening to the lectures whenever possible abhyasa could be whenever no reading is there no lecture is there at least in thought whenever the fragmentation smallness is coming in to deal with it by thinking of our real identity thinking of the permanent soul thinking of the permanent truth unchanging truth similarly the, on the other hand vairagya also has to be practiced what is the vairagya as we are clinging to what we like and hating what we dislike this cord of clinging and cord of hatred they have to be loosened vairagya means vi raga vi raga means raga means color actually it has come from color that means we are not seeing the world as it is we are always applying a color to the world color of likes and dislikes color of me and mine if it is my son we try to defend his 
defects also. If it is other sun, we are out to condemn it. Why? Because of the color of me and mine applied to the sun. So we are not able to see the world as it is. We are not able to see ourselves also as we are. We are always applying this color and seeing. In our own case, when we have done something wrong, we try to defend it by even telling lies. Because of the color of me applied there. If it is others, somebody else, we are out to blame him. Even if it is not his fault, we will try to put the blame on him and hate him or condemn him. That is because of the color of he is somebody else, not me. So the whole world always we are applying this color of me and mine and the corresponding color of likes and dislikes. So whenever we are clinging to what we like and what is mine, we have to remember this word vairagya and try to loosen that cord which is keeping us fixed to what we like, which is always as if with a rigid rod we are bound to that. The rigidity of the rod has to be lessened. The, as that rod becomes looser and looser, that is the vairagya. That as earlier we were getting too much affected by whatever we are clinging and whatever we are hating, as these cords become loose, we don't get that much affected by anything at all. So we can always judge, looking at our mind, that are we getting affected as we were getting affected earlier or not? If with age, as we grow, we are getting more and more affected, then definitely we are going the wrong way. We are not proceeding towards the goal. And if looking at our mind, we find that earlier we used to get very affected by all these things, now I can take everything without getting much affected, then definitely we are proceeding towards the goal. So this abhyasa and vairagya has to be constantly there. Now this abhyasa and vairagya, here always we have to, the main factor which is working in us is the remembrance of the truth which comes from viveka buddhi. We call it viveka buddhi. That buddhi, normally we have vishaya buddhi, which is always, is very clever in finding out by which we will gain, by which we will lose in a temporary manner. That where we will gain more money, where we will gain more property, how we can prevent the loss, how we can get some praise, how we can get reputation, all these things our mind is, our intelligence is working. But there is another aspect of the intelligence which always keeps us anchored to our inmost self which always tells us what is taking me to the auspicious goal and what will not take me to the auspicious goal. In our Shastras it is called Shreyas and Preyas. Preyas is whatever is immediately pleasurable but which takes us away from the auspicious goal. And Shreyas is the ultimate auspicious goal which may not be immediately pleasurable but which will finally take us to the auspicious goal. This Viveka Buddhi is the aspect of the Buddhi which always tells us where lies the auspiciousness, where lies this Bhadram. It goes on telling us always. Now this Viveka Buddhi, naturally the question will be there, how this Viveka Buddhi will be generated? How will it be there? Naturally, the Viveka Buddhi generates from Satsanga, from reading the scriptures it generates. But as an abhyasa, to keep it always with us, we find it difficult how to get rid of the difficulty, how to have that Viveka Buddhi always alive in us, always awake in us. That is where both Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, they show the path with a three-guna model. They call it Gunatraya Vibhaga Yoga. Where they explain the, actually these three gunas, sattva, rajas and tamas, they are everywhere in nature. In our scriptures, the whole nature is a combination of these three. But when it comes to the sadhana, in nature we are not interested in. Nature functions without any ego. It's a natural way of, it is, it goes on active, remaining active in its own manner. 
There the sattva guna means the revelation. Without the revelation we would not have known any existence. The rajoguna means activity. Without rajoguna there would not be any creation at all with, because the, even the minutest creation means activity, action. And the tamoguna means inertia there, inertia and cover up dissolution as well as inertia. Without inertia also nothing would have been remaining, even if a an ele- small particle also. It has to remain for a fraction of a second to become existent, to be visible, to be identifiable. So these three gunas are always there in nature working. That we are not concerned about. But these three gunas as they act in our nature, that if we can understand, then that will help our sadhana greatly. That is what Bhagavad Gita does in 14th chapter and 18th chapter together. And that is what Bhagavatam has also discussed in 11th Skandha, 25th chapter, in detail. So, there, Bhagavad Gita points out that it is not just the three gunas, but we have to know how these three gunas bind us. Because it is the bondage which we have to know and the bondage which we have to remove. Liberation comes from removal of the bondages. Now, which bondage comes from where and by what we can remove those bondages? That is the most important. Now, Sattvaguna is that which always reveals. So, Sattvaguna is light and knowledge. Rajoguna is always, which is related to action, but fragmented vision of the world. Action motivated by desire. Desire motivated action. And Tamoguna is always giving us ignorance, keeping us in ignorance and also inertia. Now, this Tamoguna has got two aspects of binding us. One is the inertial element, that means alasya, nidra, etc. Another is covering up the truth, covering up knowledge. Now the inertial element has to be tackled by Rajoguna because Rajoguna is the opposite of the inertia. It makes us active. And on the other hand, the covering of the knowledge taking place in our mind by the Tamoguna has to be tackled by cultivation of the Sattvaguna because Sattvaguna means knowledge. So, we have to cultivate the Sattvaguna and with the Sattvaguna we have to treat the Rajoguna also because the Rajoguna is always fragmenting our vision. It is always involving us in desire motivated activity. So, whatever actions are motivated by the Rajoguna, they are ending up in either the fulfillment of desire or non-fulfillment of desire. So, elation and depression and affectation. So, there will be sukha, there will be dukkha also, there will be agitation, there will be constriction, there will be a very narrow view of the world, whatever I like, I will see only that. Suppose somebody I dislike, then I will not see his good qualities also. He may have many good qualities, but that will not come to our mind at all. So, we have to work on this guna aspect of our personality. Now, in Bhagavad Gita, they clearly say that how these gunas are binding. In the 14th chapter, 5th verse, it's saying, Sattvam rajas tamaiti guna prakriti sambhavaha nibadnanti mahabaho dehe dehinam avyayam dehe avyayam dehinam nibadnanti So these three gunas are from the Prakriti they are generated, they are natural, they are there everywhere. But all of them are binding the Atma, the Dehi, our I, to the Deha, to the body. Which Atma? Avyayam. Normally if we identify the Atma only with the body, it is not Avyayam. It is always changing. With our body it is changing. That is what the normal I sense we have. We are always thinking that I am changing. I am changing with the body. I am changing with the mind. When the mind is suffering, 
I am suffering. When the mind is happy, I am happy. So the Atma is always undergoing changes with the body. But what they are saying is the real Atma or real identity is unchanging, unaffected. That is why they said it is Avyayam. So truly it is Avyayam, it is unchanging. But always deluded by the association with the body-mind personality, we are thinking that it is undergoing changes. So by that delusion only it is causing bondage also. I will give an example. You can see whether here I don't have anything to show but try to understand whether it gives you some clarity. Suppose there is sunlight coming in from the top. The parallel ray is sunlight coming in. Now here we put a small mirror and reflect, which will reflect the light coming from the top. If we turn the mirror a little, then will not there be a reflected beam coming from the mirror? And with that beam we can see the world, we can see various things with that reflected beam. This reflected beam will be depending on the nature of the mirror also. Suppose the mirror is wavy, then it will be having different. If the mirror is red, the reflected beam will become red. If the mirror is blue, it will be blue. If the mirror is concave, then it will go in a different manner. If it is convex, it will show the world in a different manner. So, how the world is seen through the reflected beam will depend on the property of the mirror. Are you able to follow? So, now there could be infinite number of mirrors, all of different shape, different light, different color we can have and they, if we turn in different angles, all of them will show by their reflected beam, the world will be seen by them. Now the main problem comes is that the, if the mirror starts thinking that the beam is originating from me, the reflected beam is originating from me, the source of the reflected beam is the mirror. There comes the problem. Is the source of the reflected beam the mirror or source is the original light which is coming from the top? It, the original light, if that light is not there, the mirror will not be able to reflect anything at all. But being the mirror, it is always thinking that I am seeing this beam is originating from me and with that I am seeing the world. Exactly the same thing, the consciousness idea we have about our Atma or about our consciousness, it is exactly the same, you try to visualize. We think that this Atma is limited by my body-mind personality and with that I am functioning, with that I am seeing and it is originating only in me and my Atma is different from his Atma, is different from her Atma, it is all different, all different Atmas which our Shastras repeatedly say, no, 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 no. All the Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavatam, everywhere they say that Atma is one. It is even calling it one is wrong. It is transcendental. Because the whole world appears in it. The world which has got this one, two, many, etc., they appear in this Atma. Now, this mirror, if we understand that the real beam is coming the same light is coming and reflected by thousands of mirrors, then that is the understanding of the soul. That it is the same consciousness which is manifest through the different bodies and they take, the, with the association of the body, they appear to be different, they appear to be fragmented. Truly speaking, it is one and the same. Our Shastras give the example of the waves. One sun is reflected by so many waves. It is reflected by that. Is the sun many or sun is only one? The reflection, when a wave goes, the reflection, corresponding reflection also goes. In this case, when the mirror breaks, the mirror is no longer there, mirror breaks, then the corresponding reflected beam goes. That is the death of us. So what do we do is we try to turn this mirror towards the original light. If you turn the mirror towards the original light coming from the top, then when it is looking at the original light, what happens? There is no reflected beam anymore anywhere showing anything else. This light gets merged with the original light. That is what happens in Samadhi. 
they they come to know that this atma is not limited by the body mind personality it is merged in the single transcendental consciousness it gets merged there so it is this fragmented vision which gives us a wrong idea about our soul now our viveka buddhi will always remind us of that and tell us that this is the truth that fragmented fragmented vision is not the truth but unified vision that oneness is the truth in bhagavad gita it says that सर्वूतेषु येनक भाव अव्ययमीक्षते अभिभक्त विभक्तेषु तज्ञानं विद्धि सात्विक सर्वूतेषु येनक भाव अव्ययमीक्षते अभिभक्त विभक्तेषु तज्ञानं विद्धि सात्विक दैट नॉलेज इज कॉल्ड सात्विक नॉलेज विच विच नॉलेज इज कॉल्ड सात्विक नॉलेज सर्वूतेषु येन एक अव्यय भाव ईक्षते ईक्षते मीन्स इट्स अ इनर विशन इट इज नॉट सीइंग विद द आईज इट्स नॉट एक्सटर्नल विशन इट्स एन इनर विशन एक अव्यय भाव ईक्षते वन हु सीज इन एव्रीथिंग द वन अनचेंजिंग ट्रूथ सर्वूतेषु येन एक अव्यय भाव ईक्षते अनचेंजिंग अव्यय एक वन ट्रूथ वन हि सीज अभिभक्त विभक्तेषु हि सीज द वन इन द डिवेड अपियरेन्स ऑफ द वर्ल्ड हि सीज दट वन कॉन्शियस अलोन वन आत्मा अलोन तज्ञान विद्धि सात्विक दैट नॉलेज इज कॉल्ड सात्विक नॉलेज सो टू ऑलवेज टू कीप अवर माइंड एंड इंटेलिजेंस ऑन दिस यूनिफाइड विशन to always find out the unity in diversity to find out that one truth in the multiple multiply manifest world we have to have the satvika guna if we cultivate the satvika guna then only this knowledge will become common to us will become natural to us so for that we have to take to all the whatever increases our satvika guna we talk about satvika ahara now this ahara is not just taking with the mouth ahara mean means all the inputs through all our five indriyas whatever input we take they are the aharas all the inputs are aharas if we change those inputs into satvika input for example the food has to be satvik what food it is given in 17th chapter of bhagavad gita you can see रसिया स्निग्धा स्थिरा हृदया आहारा सात्विक प्रिया वॉट एवर वी आर सींग विद द आईज दैट इज द आहारा फॉर द आईज थ्रू द आईज सपोज वी सी द विशंस विच एजिटेट्स अवर माइंड फ्रेगमेंट्स अवर माइंड एक्साइट्स अवर माइंड देन दैट इज नॉट सात्विक बिकॉज दैट इज नॉट क्रिएटिंग द यूनिफाइड विशन सो वॉट एवर विशन auspicious vision they are all will always tell us about the although it is all fragmented but they are all appearing on the same consciousness in the same soul similarly the sounds we hear we have to listen to such sounds which will remind us of this unified uniform identity this uniform truth if we listen to exciting music exciting things always quarrels and all kinds of fragmented which will make our mind fragmented then they are not satvika so we have to constantly be alert to change all our aharas into satvika in chandogya upanishad there is a samvad acha what time up to uh, this started late up to what time i am supposed to speak it is already 4:15 but i started late i think huh अप टू फोर थर्टी अच्छा नारद सनत कुमार संवाद नारद वेन ही मीट्स सनत कुमार ही आस्क सनत कुमार टू गिव हिम उपदेश गिव मी एडवाइस अबउट नॉलेज 
So naturally Sanat Kumara asked that, what do you know, you tell me first, then only I can tell you. So Narada tells him what he knows, in that it is interesting to read. Everything in the world he knew, all the Shastras, including black magic also is mentioned there. Everything, all the Vedas, all the Vedangas, all kinds of Yagas, Yajnas, what not, and even including the astrology and black magic, everything is mentioned that, everything he knew. But he said that, Mantra vida evasmi natu atma vid. He says that, but I know only the mantras. That means, I have studied everything, all these shastras, I have studied the mantras. I am a mantra vid. But natu atma vid. I don't know the truth. I don't know who am I. I don't know my atma. Tarati shoka atma vid. How do you say that you don't know your Atma? Narada himself confesses that because I know an Atmavit will be beyond Shoka. He will never get depressed. He, is, he will always be in Prasada. He will be Prasanna. But I am not able to overcome the Shoka. So I am not an Atmavit. Although I know the Vedas, I know the Upanishads, everything I know. But I have not known the Self. So you please tell me about the Self. In that, Sanat Kumara is saying that how to proceed in this sadhana, in that he says, Ahara Shuddhau Sattva Shuddhi, Sattva Shuddhau Dhruva Smritihi, Smriti Lambhe Sarva Granthi Nam Vipramokshaha. He says, Ahara Shuddhau Sattva Shuddhi. By our being will get purified when we purify our Ahara. It's not just the ahara through the mouth, as I said. All the inputs we have to be careful about. When we purify our ahara, then our being gets purified. Because our being is meant, made of this ahara. Not only the food we take, definitely the gross body is made of that, even the subtle part also is made of the food. But what about the other food which we are always taking through the eyes, through the ears? They are always building us inside. Whatever pictures we are seeing in the film, in the TV, in the computer, they are all creating, they are all creating our mind, our emotions. They all have to be purified. Otherwise, where from will purity dawn? If we hear, hear some pure words and go back and again expose ourselves to all kinds of impure things, then the purity will not come to us at all. Ahara shuddhau sattva shuddhi. To have our being purified, we have to purify our all kinds of inputs. Sattva shuddhau dhruva smritihi. The constant remembrance of the Lord, which we are talking about, that remembrance. The constant dhruva smriti means, dhruva means constant. Smriti means the memory, the remembrance of the Lord will come when the being becomes purified for a pure mind, pure emotion, pure intelligence, pure body, that we don't have to struggle anymore for the remembrance of the truth, remembrance of the Lord. That is why he says the last thing is, Smriti Lambhe Sarvagranthi Nam Vipramokshaha. Vipramokshaha. V means Vishesha Rupena, Pra means Prakishta Rupena, Mokshaha. Sarvagranthi Nam, all the knots as we started with our shloka. Vidyate Hridayagranthi Chidyante Sarvasam Shayaha Shiyante Chasya Karmani. In Upanishad it is Tasmin Drishte Paravare. Here it is Drishte, drishte Atmani Ishvare, Ishvare, something like that. So, Sarvagranthi Nam Vipramokshaha. All the knots of the heart, they get broken. Vipramoksha, V means Visheshaarupana, the knots in various aspects of our life, aspects of our emotion, each will be get, each will be open, untied. And Pramoksha means Prakishtarupana means will be untied very well, that you will not again create the knot. So it is all a sadhana of purity. Purity finally means desirelessness and nothing else. It is only desirelessness. Whatever we do, the Upanishads also may start with various models of soul, model of Brahman, the concept of Brahman and all. But when we go towards the end, 
दे ओनली से यदा सर्वे प्रविद्यन्ते हृदयस्य यह ग्रंथय और यदा सर्वे प्रमुच्यन्ते कामायस्य हृदिश्रिता अथ मो अमृत भवती अत्र ब्रह्म समश्नुते वेन ऑल द डिजायर्स ऑफ द हार्ट आर रिमूव्ड दे आर ऑल क्लियर देन हियर इट सेल्फ इन दिस बॉडी man becomes immortal he realizes the immortality so everywhere it is ultimately the desirelessness now here to complete our sadhana through the triguna tatva is that even the sattva guna which gives rise to the viveka buddhi and which helps us to know the lord which takes us closest to the lord that sattva guna also binds bhagavad gita says sukha sange na badnati jnana sange na janaga that sattva guna which we used to get over the tamoguna bondage and rajoguna bondage that sattva guna also is binding in nature sukha sange na badnati jnana sange na janaga so it is not binding us with the other kind of sensory pleasure or nidra alasya etc the idleness etc but it is binding us with the clinging to the peaceful sukha that we have through the sattva guna and it binds us to the knowledge always we are given to the knowledge and whenever we get more and more knowledge we get a sukha corresponding to that that becomes a bondage because constantly we would like to be in sattva guna only we will try to always if we read if we meditate if we go on doing that we will cling to that we will not reach the liberated position the shuddha sattva which comes when the bondage of the sattva guna also is removed so how to attain that how to get rid of the sattva guna bondage that bhagavata states very clearly in the shrimad bhagavatam he says in the 11th skanda 25th chapter 34 35 36 etc nisango maam bhajeet vidwan apramatto jitendriya rajas tamas cha bhijeet sattva samsevaya munihi he says that by the constant practice of sattva guna he overcomes the rajoguna and the tamoguna then sattvam cha bhijeet yukto nairapekshena shantadhihi sampadyate gunair mukto jeevo jeevam vihayamam he says that that sattva guna bondage also has to be overcome how to do that he says that that is overcome by nirapeksha non expectation it is the same as surrender or sharanagati non expectation we have to think about it very well not expecting anything from anywhere from anybody any time in the world not expecting anything from anybody anywhere any time if something happens god is all knowing god is all pervading god is all doing so if i lose my relatives if i lose my property if i lose my job has it not by done by god himself so why should there be a if i am a devotee why should there be any reluctance to accept it so there should not be any reluctance at all there should not be any expectation at all that is the ultimate and through that nirapekshata we overcome the sattva guna also because suppose you want to study only read the shastras only remain in meditation but something happens which needs my attention i have to do that work i should be able to do that also leaving my shastric studies leaving my meditation i should be equally at ease in doing all those things also so this nirapekshata is given the highest position in our shastras non expectation bhagavatam says 
నిరపేక్ష మునిం శాంతం నిర్వైరం సమదర్శనం అనువ్రజామ్యహం నిత్యం పూయేత్యంఘిరేణుభి హి సేస్ దట్ అ ముని అ థాట్ఫుల్ పర్సన్ హు ఈస్ నిరపేక్ష శాంత నిర్వైర అండ్ సమదర్శన యాక్చువల్లీ ఆల్ దీస్ కమ్ ఫ్రమ్ ద నిరపేక్షత ఇట్ సెల్ who does not expect from anywhere will he always not be shanta peaceful because all our tension stress comes from expectation you try in your own mind whenever there is a stress there is an expectation either a fear or an expectation both are expectation you remove that expectation make the mind ready to accept anything immediately the stress will go the strain will go everything that readiness to accept any situation no stress will be there in the mind at all he is nirvairam that means he does not have any enemy it is not so nirvairam means in his mind he does not have enmity there could be enemies outside but he does not consider them to be enemy his mind is free of the vaira bhava of enmity samadarshanam who sees everything with the samatva that as the bhagavad gita the entire yoga is samatva yoga the success failure sukha dukha friend enemy everything he takes with non expectation that itself is samadarshana now what is the lord saying he says that i walk behind that devotee if a devotee is like this who is a nirapeksha who does not expect anything from anywhere i walk i follow that devotee why puye tyanghri renubhi so that i can purify myself by taking his padaraja by taking the dust of his feet are you able to follow the god is saying that i purify myself with the dust of the feet of that devotee so it is not composed by god it is composed by some saint and what is he saying this is composed by vyasadeva what does he mean by that he is giving this nirapekshata the highest position in life that when we don't expect anything from anywhere any time in the world there cannot be any higher position such a person will not be even looking for moksha so called moksha liberation or even self realization whatever be the self realization he will not be worried about it whether he is a self realized or not also he will not think he is satisfied he is fulfilled forever na parameshtham na mahendra dhishnyam na sarva bhaumam na rasadhipatyam న యోగ సిద్ధీర్ అపునర్భవం వా మై అర్పితాత్మేచ్ఛతి మై అర్పితాత్మేచ్ఛతి మద్వినాన్యత హి సేస్ దట్ హీ డస్ నాట్ వాంట్ ఎనీ ద బ్రహ్మలోక ఆర్ ద స్వర్గరాజ్య మహేంద్ర దిష్యం ఆర్ ద హోల్ ఎంపర్షిప్ ఆఫ్ ద వర్ల్డ్ ఈవెన్ ఆఫ్ ద పాతాల రాజ్య రసాధిపత్యం he does not look for any yoga siddhi or moksha punarbhavam va mai arpita atme chati madvinanyata one who has given himself to me whose mind is always given to my thought he does not expect anything from anywhere at all even moksha he does not expect